Well, thank you for staying. <laughs> Hell yeah! I don't want to waste everybody's time. Uh, I think they said I got 15. I don't know if I'm, I'm going to hit that. I really noticed the public speaking. Uh, I don't know where to begin. JBL, where should I start? I'm a lot of things in this world. Well, for, you know what, first, congratulations to all the other inductees and the presenters. We've seen some very talented individuals here. Uh, there are talented individuals in these seats. There are heroes of mine. There are people I have looked up to. There are people I have worked with. Um, and I'm proud to be here, and I'm proud to go share wrestling rings and roads and cars with a lot of you that are here today. Uh, I've been a lot of things in my life. First and foremost, currently, and probably the thing that I'm most proud of is I am April's husband. <laughs> None of this is about me. This is all going to be about the people that got me here to this moment. Uh, because I think professional wrestling is so interesting. I think a lot of us have quirks and we're so ego-driven and you got to believe in yourself so much to make it. You have to sacrifice, you have to survive. But the truth is, none of us really get to where we're going without a village. My wife has helped me tremendously and she currently inspires me to be a better person, to try to understand myself and other things better, and I love her to death. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for her. The business it's a lot different when I got in it. But the basics and the fundamentals of professional wrestling are the same as they ever was. If it worked in the 1940s, it can work today. You just have to know how to apply it. And the basics and the fundamentals of professional wrestling were taught to me by a steel. I started goofing off in a backyard with my friends in 1993. Right? It was just something to do. I liked comic books. I liked stuff that got beat me up, that, that got me beaten up at school. I didn't fit in anywhere. And in fact, show of hands, how many here, how many here are wrestlers? How many here are taking a bump before? Now, do you remember why you got in the business in the first place? Because you loved it. You had to love it. All the race. Well, we're gonna get to Harley. Don't worry, we're going to get to hard. I got into this business because I loved it, but I also didn't fit in anywhere. I tried out for the football team my freshman year of high school. They told me I had to cut my hair. I said, well, that's not for me. I was more into being the opinionated punk rock kid with a six-inch livery spike mohawk. I thought that was more important at the time. I tried out for the wrestling team. They said, congratulations, you made it. Man, you got you to gotta fucking cut that hair. And now I walk around and all the NFL players got Mohawks. I feel like I might have missed the boat, but I'm glad I did because I had to outsource and I found wrestling. Moving off in the backyard with my friends, I was the ambitious one. I borrowed some lumber from local, <laughs> some local businesses, let's just say, and I built myself a wrestling ring that our friends would goof off in. That turned into saving money to buy a ring from somebody in Texas, and I, I, I think it wound up being an old UWF ring. And from there, I realized we, we ran our first show in 1997, and I remember watching the VHS tape that night and thinking, holy shit, we suck. <laughs> but I had gone out and got a promoter's license because the only thing I knew was punk rock. I knew do it yourself. I know if you wanted to do something, if I wanted to be in a band, go to the pawn shop, Maybe, maybe borrow an instrument. <laughs> I didn't know there was wrestling schools. The internet wasn't really a huge thing yet. I met a steel and a guy named Danny Dominion in the bathroom of the Rosemont Horizon at a WWF house show. They gave me a business card. And I was like, what is this, a wrestling school? Huh. I didn't know you had to go to school. I had heat on me because I was a backyard wrestler. I showed up and beat the crap out of me. It's been a love affair ever since. From there, I wrestled every weekend I possibly could. 
nothing mattered, girlfriends, jobs, responsibilities. The only thing that I cared about was getting in a car with whoever I could and driving anywhere. And we were lucky because we were in Chicago. We were very central. I could drive to Michigan and the Upper Peninsula. I could cross over into Canada until I got thrown out the first time. <laughs> I could go to Minnesota. You could drive down to Kentucky, Indiana. 13, 14, 15 hour drives to Philadelphia. We went everywhere. Now this is back in the time when you had to write down a resume, put a couple of promos and matches on a VHS tape and send them out. And promoters would call you. <laughs> Mickey knows. And you would get and you would get booked. And I think the first match that I would say kind of put me on the map was when I got to wrestle two guys, Ray Mysterio Jr. and a man by the name of Eddie Guerrero. Yeah. And I wish Eddie was here. Yeah. Yes. I wish Ray was here. He appears to have left. That's fine. I understand Ray. Right? Right, right? There's a lot of people I wish were here. I wish Steve Kern was here. He's not dead. He's just in Florida. That might be worse. <laughs> Sorry, but I'm like ninety percent of the wrestlers in the world live and are from Florida, so you know, what do I know? I was fortunate enough to meet Eddie Guerrero, I think it was maybe 2001, and man, this guy, this guy changed my life. He he was so kind and he was sweet and he was going through it. He had just been fired, he was going through a divorce, he was worried about seeing his kids, uh, but all he knew was wrestling. So he was on the road, he was working independent shots. He was getting booked in New Japan, and I remember meeting him for the first time, and him looking at me and saying, I don't like three ways that don't make any sense to me, and it's okay with you, you and Ray put it together, and just call it to me. And I had very limited experience with going out and just kind of winging it. You know, I'm, I'm an indie kid. We would sit down and map everything out from A to B. And man, if you got concussed or the ring broke, or you know, a riot broke out or something, something happened, you didn't know how to zig or how to zag. You learn on the you, you learn on the fly. But Eddie that night made me realize how garbage I actually was, but made me feel like, man, there's so much room for improvement. And if this guy is willing to step in the ring with me wearing basketball shorts and Doc Martens, I need to up my game to show him respect. Because none of this is about me. I stand on the shoulders of giants, literally. I would not be able to do any of this if it wasn't for people like Eddie Guerrero, for people like Tracy Smothers. I wish Chris Candido was here. And I am now, thank you, thank you. I am now of the age where, unfortunately, my contemporaries are passing away. Jay Briscoe, Bray Wyatt, Two people who should still be with us. Two people who I consider to be young, still. Terry Funk recently just passed away. I was fortunate to know Terry Funk. Man, Terry Funk lived a life. I think if you would have asked Terry right before he went, are you ready to go? He would have told you he was ready to go 10 years ago. <laughs> but Bray, Jay Briscoe, I don't think they were ready, so I think it's important to remember them. The first name I ever worked in the wrestling business was Tracy's mother's, and I was scared to death because he came up to me in the locker room and he said, oh, hey, man, hey, you look, oh, you look good, you're sweating, you eat games of tuna, you lift weights, you do lift and lift, oh, man, listen, listen, man, I see those matches you have with Ace and with uh, Chris Hero, man, all that stuff you do, oh, God, I can't do any of that, I can't remember any of that either, so if it's okay with y'all, I said, okay, we just call it out there, and I acted cool, like, sure. <laughs> We'll just walk and talk, baby. <laughs> I was terrified. And when I saw him in the ring, and he ran outside, and he grabbed the fans' nachos and their cheese, and I knew I was wrestling in a barn in southern Indiana with a five and a half hour drive ahead of me, no shower. I was like, this son of a bitch is going to cover me in nacho cheese. 
We didn't talk about this in the back. This was not planned. And he grabbed me, and he grabbed that nacho cheese, and he said, Fuck the cheese, brother. <laughs> and a light bulb went off in my head, and I said, This guy's just talking to me. This is amazing. I mean, I don't have to talk to people before the show. Oh, this solves so many of my problems. That began the part of my career where I would actively hide from my opponents. Oh, what's called that? Yeah. All of that independent wrestling and traversing the United States and going to Japan, going to Puerto Rico, going to Europe. Back when you had to smuggle merch into Europe and you were terrified because you were just a 19, 20 year old kid and you're reading the declaration thing and you're like, if you have more than $10,000 and you're like, oh shit. If I sell too many t-shirts, they're gonna get me on the way back. <laughs> Nobody's ever taught me about any of this stuff. God damn it. I, I landed a spot in Ring of Honor. And it's the first time I ever met Mickey James, who's a re re she's like a rabbit spider. She's, a, she's not, not a bad penny, but a good man. She keeps coming back. I met Mickey James for the first time. Eddie Guerrero was still wrestling there. I learned from a guy named Raven. And I learned, and listen, I know, I know a lot of people, they might not like Raven. Here's a little secret too. A lot of people might not like me. But Raven, coupled with the things that Eddie has taught me, and Tracy had taught me, and Ace taught me, and you mix it up with what Raven taught me. He's like, ah, eh, kid, listen, ah. Eh. It's not about the moves. The first time I ever wrestled Raven, if I may record some of your time for this ridiculous story, he got a ridiculous amount of color on one of those Wednesday night TNA pay-per-views, right? And I'm wrestling him for, for North Connors IWC. You were probably there, Joe. I think you were 12. <laughs> He's got the, 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 the Crockett era Ric Flair just athletic tape on his head and he's sitting there and I've never met him before and I walk up to him and I'm like, oh, hello sir, hi, you know, my name's, my name's Punk, you know, whatever you want to do. And he's like, ah, just tell me a couple things you do, kid. Ah, uh, you know, maybe we'll do this. And as I'm talking to him, he, he just starts leaking. <laughs> he hasn't done anything, but he got such great color Wednesday night at the Nashville Fairgrounds. He's leaking. And I'm looking yeah. at him and I'm, like, I'm like, you're bleeding. And he goes, ah, shit. There's a match about to go out. Some kid's about to debut. Raven grabs him and he goes, Ah, sorry, kid, we gotta go. And he's just like, Start fighting. And we start, we start brawling and we go through the curtain because he's already bleeding. He's like, We gotta go. So, once again, thank you, Tracy Smothers. Thank you, Eddie Guerrero. Thank you, Ace Steer. You have given me the knowledge to not be afraid of going out and doing something on the fly with a man that I had just met and never wrestled before. He's bleeding. I start chopping the shit out of him. And he's going, eh! Eh! And he starts giving me his shoulder. And I'm like, this motherfucker, you know? Stop giving me your shoulder. I'm trying to, I'm waffling this shit up. A little lesson learned. We did the back and he goes, eh, kid, come here. Listen, chops are stupid. They hurt, and they suck, and don't ever chop me again. And I was like, <laughs> Julie knows, but we didn't talk about it, so, you know. I didn't know. Armed with the new knowledge that I got from Raven and so many others, I continue to wrestle. Tommy Dreamer calls me one day and he says, The WWE wants to take a look at you. And I said, Shut the fuck up. No, they don't. This is 2004, maybe. He says, No, they really, really do. I was doing dark matches. Tom Pritchard was booking extra talent. And he said they legitimately want to take a look at me. And I thought, well, this is the chance. WWF to me was never the goal. I looked up to people who went to Japan to wrestle. I thought the idea of going to Japan and being a superstar, like a Bruce Brody or a Stan Hansen or an Eddie Guerrero, and then coming home and nobody knowing who you are, man, I thought that was the coolest idea in the world. That's what I wanted. When I wrestled in Japan, Hashimoto told me, maybe too big cruiserweight, too small heavyweight. My dreams dashed against the rocks. 
but tommy called and i said, tommy if they legitimately want to look at me i said i'm not i'm not a wwe guy you know i'm a little skinny fat hunter famously called me that on tv he wasn't wrong i wore basketball shorts i dedicated myself i, I, I told tommy, tommy i said give me give me six to eight months i'm gonna bust my ass and i'm gonna get in the shape and i do everything i can to when they legitimately take a look at me they will not be able to say no and in the line of this not this being about me i want to thank val venus i had a match with him on sunday night he that that got me my job and i knew it got me my job and people will tell me that i'm cocky and i know sometimes i am but i knew leaving that ring i said i almost had abs jb believe it or not you said something up here yesterday that really resonated with me. You got to work out hard to look this bad. <laughs> the same is true for me. So I'm offered a job and I'm blown away. And I pack up everything I own in my 2001 Monte Carlo, which is the first thing I ever bought with my own money. I'm going to jump back in time. I'm going to jump back in time really, really quick here. That 2001 Monte Carlo, I don't know if anybody's ever heard the story about Harley Race and my 2001 Monte Carlo. The first time I ever met oh, Harley Race, he was a special guest referee for a match I had in Wisconsin. And Harley comes up to me before the match and he goes, Hey, kid, don't do any of that one, two, one, two. One, two, bullshit. <laughs> I don't get up and down as fast as I used to. <laughs> and I don't, I don't think Harley wanted to count like Marco Lubitsch just yet. I think he had too much pride. And I was terrified of Harley Race. He's the toughest man in professional wrestling he's ever seen. Sorry, Harley. Yeah. <laughs> Every time I would get taken over in a headlock takeover, Harley would come over and he'd go, what do you say? And he would stick his index and his middle finger straight up both my nostrils. <laughs> and, I was, and I was just a, a young 20-something punk kid looking at the lights going, why is Harley Race doing this to me? <laughs> and if you've ever met Harley, Harley had legit hands of steel and his fingers were like sausages so to actually jam his fingers in my nose it hurt quite a lot not as tough as harley race harley race liked me for some reason and i didn't get it tracy smothers liked me for some reason and i didn't know why i never fit in anywhere before eddie guerrero loved me and i never knew why later that night at the bar harley race is accepting shots from every single fan He's getting loaded, but if you know anything about Harley Race, you know this guy can get loaded. His loaded is a different planet than anybody else's loaded, right? But Harley was a little bit older. He wasn't the legendary Harley from the 70s. Sure, he could probably drink harder. I think he might have got to him a little bit. Ace comes up to me and he goes, hey, can you stick around? We'll just take Harley back to the hotel later. I said, yeah, sure, no problem. So it's later that night, Harley comes out of the bar, we're walking in the car, and I'm watching Harley. It sounds very disrespectful to say he was waddling, but it had a lot more to do with the state of inebriation than it did with his body type or anything else. Harley waddles out of the bar, and he stops, and he gives me, he gives me one of these. <laughs> this is my brand new, 2001 Monte Carlo is the first thing I ever bought with my own money. He sits shotgun, he sits in the back seat, we're driving to the hotel, and I'm looking at Harley, and all of a sudden he goes, hmm. <laughs> and I'm driving my car, and I'm just like, there's no way. He's the hardest man in professional wrestling history. This man can hold his alcohol. Rolls the window down. 
turns in a noise I will never forget as long as I live. He says, and spits a mouthful of vomit out the window. And I'm driving, I'm going at a good pace. It immediately blows back all over a steel. And I look at the rear mirror and I'm just like, holy shit. And I look at Harley and he does it again. And he slowly turned, like, I don't think Harley had a quick bone in his body. Everything was slow. He just slowly turned to the window and he went, like a balloon deflated. So I start to pull over. He does it again. But this time, since I'm pulling over, he turns to me. Swallows and, and grabs my forearm and says, Don't pull over. You'll alert the authorities. <laughs> this continues the entire way to this hotel room. We get to the hotel room. Great. So I get, I get home. 
I rest. Monday morning, my first day on the job, I show up to the rental car uh, desk in Cleveland, Ohio, and there's Mickey James. And I go, Mickey, what are you doing here? And she's like, they're calling me up, and I heard, is it me and you? Are we doing something? And I went, I don't know. So we rode together to the building, and we get there, and somebody comes up to us, and they says, you guys are on Sunday Night Heat. And for the kids in the audience, that used to be a little show. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> So me and Mickey get told that uh, we're, we're together, but we're running around. Do you remember Alex, SmackDown writer? Okay, Alex could yeah, Alex Greenfield. He couldn't tell me shit. He was like, you guys are together. And I went, me and Mickey got together really great. Are we brother and sister? Are we married? Are we together? Are we like Mickey and Mallory from Natural Born Killer? I just started like, you know, spitball. And as we're talking, Michael Hayes walks by and goes, CM Punk, I don't get it. <laughs> first, first day on the job, and I look at Mickey, and Mickey's been busting her ass in Ohio Valley Wrestling. And I looked at Mickey, and I was just like, oh man, pressure's on. I can't fumble this fucking ball because it's her career. Uh, Hunter comes up to the ball and says, you just thankfully reminded me. And he looks at Mickey and he goes, you, I get it. And he looks at me and he goes, you, I get it. He goes, together? Because I don't fucking get it. And he walks away. So to set the table, um, debuting, Mickey's debuting. Uh, <laughs> I'm supposed to be a baby face. I have purple hair. And we're in Cleveland, and they're going to announce me from Chicago. And I just, you know, I got like shitty tattoos, and I'm with the hot girl with the big boobs. And I just remember pulling Mickey aside, and going, "This isn't going to work. <laughs> this is, they're going to they're going to boo the shit out of me, and you're going to take the stray for this one." We came up with an elaborate entrance, and I think we even might have kissed, and that was the kiss that got the instant I kissed you in front of Cleveland, they might have started throwing fucking garbage at me. I proceeded to have an eh, okay match, but it wasn't up to snuff, and I remember getting it back, and Arn and Hunter and Sean were just kind of standing in the corner, and it felt like high school because they were all just like kind of pointing. I knew they were talking about me, and I was just like, I guess I should have been. And then, and then I got sent to Ohio Valley Wrestling, and I figured six months tops. You never would have got to meet me, JBL. How sad. But the best thing about being at OVW is I got to work with Danny Davis. And I don't know if there's a big thing in my career. I don't know if my Danny liked me. All these old school guys, all these tough guys, I don't know why they put up with me, and I don't know why they liked me. Paul Heyman would allow me to come to the Davis Arena on Tuesday night and help write the television show. Because my thing was, I'm never going to call up. I, I, that was my one chance. Back then, with all those names on the roster that I listed, it was, it was just a shark tank. You weren't going to get a shot. And I figured that was my one shot. But as long as I was going to be in that house, I was going to learn as much as I could from Danny Davis and Paul Hammond. And Paul spent his time and taught me how to write a television show. He taught me how to time a television show. He taught me half a second out, half a second in for commercial. Danny Davis and Paul let me sit in the control room with them and learn how to edit a television show Wednesday night. This is when I started drinking coffee. I developed insomnia. That is not a joke. That is real life. I figured I had six months. I was going to learn as much as I possibly could. And when I was back on the Indies, I was going to apply that. Um, I slipped through the cracks. Paul Hannon got me in and got me on television. Somehow with CM Punk. I figured I was going to be an astronaut or a farmer or something. But to me, that meant it's not that Vince didn't care. It's just that he didn't care enough about me or ECW that I was able to slip under the radar and see him punk. I was seeing punk 15 years old wrestling in the backyard. I had no business 
being on WWE television with these giants and these legends wrestling with CM Punk, but I did. And JBL, I don't know, they put the title on me. I won the money in the bank. I was in the right place at the right time. And, you know, this guy who, let's be honest, people would tell horror stories about, okay? He's the only, I, I, I remember having a match with Batista and you, and I'm, I'm the little guy, I'm taking bumps, and I'm supposed to be a baby face, and I'm supposed to be the champion, but it was, you know, I'm getting, I'm getting shit kicked out of me, I'm getting power bombed, you're Larry, I mean, you know, like, it was, it was the job, and I remember laying there, and they kind of threw the title on me, this is the main event, it just wasn't working, there's two household name superstars and a new guy who probably didn't deserve the gold at the time, and I was laying there thinking, well, this sucks for me, but like, I mean, I understand the position I'm in. So, you know, I don't know, back to the drawing board. And you marched back to the ring, unannounced, didn't tell anybody you're doing this, didn't tell me, you got in the ring, you picked me up, and I was like, oh, he's just gonna close my day again. <laughs> and you shot me off the ropes and you said, got one GTS. And I was just like, first guy to do that for me. Thank you. Yeah. Like Eddie Guerrero, like Harley Race, like Tracy's mother, like all these other people that I've watched on television that I wanted to emulate. This is somebody who I thought, never in a million years, would like me. For some reason he did. I don't know. I don't know if I, at some, some point along the way I gained the respect. I gained Taker's respect. And that is the point of all this, because none of this is about me. This is about the people who came before me. And I miss a lot of them. I miss Eddie. I miss Chris Candido. I miss Tracy Smothers. I miss Harley Race. I miss Terry Bunk. But it makes me appreciate the ones that we still have that I can still text every day. I can still text Jerry Briscoe. I can still text Bret Hart. And I can still see all of you. And if it wasn't for all of you, and I mean that, everybody, because that's the other big thing is I'm appreciative of every promoter who's ever paid me or not paid me because it's been, it's been a lesson, you know? None of us are anything if it wasn't for the fans. <laughs> now, we can all be egomaniacs and talk shit about them. I'm the best, I'm on this, I'm that, I'm that. But the fact is that the seats are empty. There is no us. Now I know throughout my career, probably rubbed some people the wrong way. Some people like me, some don't. What I always had was the backing of legends. Teal, your father, who's my my hero, Roddy Piper. Roddy Piper's the reason I'm a wrestler today. And I remember the last time I saw him and he told me he was proud of me. So when people tell me that they don't like me or the internet's mad at me, I just kind of chuckle because Roddy Piper liked me. <laughs> Dusty Rhodes loved me. <laughs> I had the respect and the backing of Harley Race before I went to the WWE. And to me, that means more than all the money in the world. But because these legends put their stamp on me before anybody even knew who I was, it gave me the confidence and it gave me the ability to succeed in a place where I don't think I ever fit in. And I've always struggled with a little bit of imposter syndrome. You know, it's a strange business. You're supposed to you're supposed to just talk shit. You're supposed to tell everybody that you're the best. Everybody compares numbers. I drew this number. I made this much money. I won this title. I did this, I did that. I completely lost my train of thought. It's like one day I just woke up and I was an old timer and I was at the college bar alley club. <laughs> Thank you.
story is, what means the most to me now is sharing a locker room and have those kids come up to me and they tell me, and I get emotional when they tell me, and they tell me, man, I saw you sit cross-legged on a stage in Las Vegas and that brought me back to wrestling. Or I see a kid come up to me and they show me a tattoo and it says straight edge, and they say, I've never done drugs, smoked, drank because of you. And to me, just like the stamp of legends, that means so much to me. And if there was a reason I'm still doing this, it's that. People come up to you and they say, you saved my life. It's, it sounds a little far-fetched, but God damn it, I understand. And I take that responsibility to heart, and that means a lot to me, because I was touched through pro wrestling by legends like Roddy Roddy Piper and Terry Funk and Harvey Race. To so know that I inspired you with just one kid to do something positive or to get into this business and to respect this business, that means the world to me. So this award means the world to me. I'm sorry for wasting so much of your time. One more, one more Harley Race story, because this one's good. I think you're really going to like this one. Is it okay if I tell this? You could have said no. You really do like me. God bless you. Thank you. Yeah. I may have been in Madison Square Garden against this guy. And I was terrified. I was like, ah, he's going to kill me. This guy hates me. He's going to make me drink a beer. I don't know what. And right before the match, he walks in the locker room and just looks at me, dead in the eye, shakes my hand, and goes, Madison Square Garden, it's on by 20,000 people. Nobody gets to see this. Congratulations. Enjoy yourself. Have fun. <laughs> and I was just like, oh, man, I don't think I can tell anybody that story. He's really kind of a nice guy. He's going to ruin his whole gimmick. You know? I'm on a show. We're in Elvin. We're at Buzzer McGee's, which is the bar that's directly across from Harley Race's school. Haku, you know what I'm talking about. No? Okay. I might have, did you go to bed? No, you're still there. Okay, good. <laughs> so, Harley buys shots for everybody. Now, we just got done working the show, and we're sitting there, and the waitress comes by, and she puts a shot in front of everybody, and then, here's me, she puts a shot in front of me. And everyone looks at me, and I go, <laughs> and she goes, Harley Race bought those shots, honey, you better drink it. And I said, I don't drink. And she said, Harley Race bought those shots, honey, you better drink it. Coco, I said, I don't drink. And she said, Harley Race bought those shots, honey, you better, I thought she was going to beat me up. She like got in my face. And I was just like, I don't drink, I don't drink. So now everyone's giving me shit, you know. That's, it's eighth grade all over again. Just drink it, it's only one shot, just drink it. I'm like, I don't drink. I look over at Harley, Harley's looking at me, he's holding the shot glass. And I'm just like, no, I guess it's been a good run. I'll never work in the business again. I, I, I don't drink. And everyone did the shot, and mine's still sitting there. I think Ace probably took the bullet for me and drank it. And I was just sitting there, and I, I felt, I don't know, I felt this, I just felt weird. So I was like, let's just make it weird. And I get up, and I go to the bartender, and I go, do you guys have milk? She's like, hang on. She opens the fridge and she goes, who knew? We have milk. And I looked and I counted and I was like, I need 17 shots of milk. <laughs> now, I'm not a suicidal person, but I was flirting. I was flirting with it right here. So we had 17 shots of milk. And just like before, a little deja vu with the same waitress plunks down a shot in front of everybody, but this time last is Harley, plunks a shot of milk right in front of Harley Race, and I'm sitting behind him and I'm looking at him, and he does this. <laughs> is that milk? <laughs> and I'm holding the shot glass, and I went, yes boss. Everyone waits, nobody's touching their shot glass. And Harley Race picks up his shot glass and he raises it to me. And then everyone else.
Gus follows suit, downs the shot of elk, slams it in front of him, and he didn't beat me up. <laughs> and I figured at that point, if Harley Race accepted the punk rock kid from Chicago who wore basketball shorts and Doc Martens and had no business knowing we're wrestling for Harley Race, that I was going to be okay. Everything else has been gravy since then. I have dreamed bigger and done things 15-year-old me never would have believed. And I've failed huge. But I think I've succeeded even bigger because I've learned from all those failures. And it has been my pleasure and my honor. And if I have made you happy in a wrestling ring, if I have made you mad in a wrestling ring, that's even better. Yeah. It's been my pleasure. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much.